aspetta ragazzi Siete al lavoro pronti? identify some of the, the risks and challenges that you might face, whether it be fire or flood, um, and there'll be other risks that we can talk about, but also to help build your confidence into the future to address uh, those risks and realise that you do actually have a whole lot of amazing skills already in place that you can draw on. Going forward. Yeah. Yeah. If you do all this preparation work that you're doing, um, if there is an emergency, whatever it is, you will recover so much more quickly. So if you've got your social networks in place and you've got your plans in place, um, if you've got your box with your stuff in place, um, you're ready to go, you'll be one step ahead because you are prepared and organised and your mind is in the right sort of space. Hey Shelley. Hi Jess. Hey there. <laughs> Here we go. Off to Dan Dongadale. Well, I just think that workshop, to make it meaningful, it needs to go somewhere. So, obviously it's meaningful for them to be able to have access to all those services and I think that's fantastic. But then, where are they going to go with this and how are they going to make this meaningful for the next disaster that hits them? And are they going to get those changes that they want? Because they made some really good points about next time if there was an emergency, this is what we need to see and this is what we'd like to see and we don't all have internet and phones. And so. But that, that has to go to the Shire and the Shire um, and the emergency management people, they need to know that. So how do they how do they get that information if it doesn't, if it stops with the resilience community or it stops at the end of that workshop? That was my only concern. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so I reckon a follow-up discussion about how you're going and perhaps reminding people about what some of the other communities have done as well after they've done an exercise like this. So Shelley, during the fires you were you evacuated? We did evacuate. We actually just got back from holidays um, the day before. I was so badly prepared. I left with less on that evacuation than I had been on holidays with because I was just sick of it. It was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And I couldn't even think. 
I just didn't know what to do, what to take. I just couldn't believe how stupid I was, really. So what do you reckon you do next time? Well, you know, I've tried to talk to you about this, Jess, the Ready Plan <laughs> and the app, but I plan to sit down with the family because I know in that Ready Plan it talked about asking, you know, your children as well about what's important to them and what do they want to put in their box. And I thought that was really nice because when it was left up to me that day, I just couldn't even think and I wouldn't have packed anything that was what everyone else wanted except for probably passports. COVID's been really tough, hasn't it? It's this whole thing of, you know, after a major disaster like a bushfire, it's so important to get the community together so they can share stories and start to help each other and rebuild. But with COVID, it's just been, it's been almost impossible for what, about 12, nearly 12 months? COVID has really set a lot of things back. There's been no connectivity between people out here. So we are just on our way um, Use the left lane to, take the M3 slip road. to deliver some hotel entry packs um, because here in Queensland um, we have some Continue involvement on M3 with for one kilometre. Um, the hotel quarantine guests um, and these hotel entry packs are basically um, useful information for the guests uh, such as important contact numbers and also some well-being information and activities. From Red Cross, we've got some of the hotel entry packs. Hotel entry packs, the red book books for the guests. Let's put them on here. Hi. Uh, hotel entry packs. It's a really important resource for the hotel guests to have. Um, I know there's been feedback of the people who they really appreciate um, just having all the essential information in one useful place and also to have those those techniques and methods to help them deal with this, this situation you know um, being locked down at home is one thing being quarantined in a hotel you know potentially on your own is very very different but it's good to know that we are able to provide them um, with this booklet co with the combined with the phone calls that we make from our um, tele outreach center but we're really doing what we can to help these people get through this situation. Hey, so I've just arrived at the Walwer Bush Nursing Centre. It's effectively like a, a local hospital um, without some of the kind of major services. But we're going to catch up with Sandy Grove here and um, hear about what happened during the fires. The fires came across um, up over that mountain and um, a lot of the locals actually sheltered in the bush nursing centre here. Access and egress will always be challenging for us. There's literally yeah, yeah, yeah. one road in and one road out. So we become isolated and cut off really easily. Yeah, sure, really sure. Quickly. So one thing we um, are starting to roll out is um, what we call Ready Community. Yep. We use these um, big apps, so this is my beauty. Yeah. And um, it's really interesting because it's probably got similar issues to yeah. here. So yeah, yeah, with regards to isolation and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. surrounded by sort of forested yeah. hills. Mm -hmm. um, the roads get cut off pretty quickly if they're fires. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's this whole thing about self sufficiency. Very inclusive, which is lovely. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, part, I think part of the real benefit of planning is actually getting the community together to talk about this stuff. So this, this all burns as well, you can see those oh, trees yeah, right. down here. It's yeah. interesting, isn't it, that it's not that long ago and yet um, so much of the bush has 
regenerated. That sometimes it's even difficult to see where there was fire. In your message to me, you said that some people who are normally fine are pretty mm. resilient, are mm. not, not doing so well. And so people that I thought were really had their stuff together and have been absolute stalwarts through the fire and then in the subsequent period through a recovery phase suddenly you know we're seeing those people falling apart yeah. and you know what has been incredibly um i guess confronting for me is that that's me like i'm resilient and i'm um and i just worked throughout you know right through the fires and then in the recovery period continued on and and i'm i feel fine um but when i see these other people that have also said yeah, yeah i'm sure, fine yeah. only as recently as two and three weeks ago yeah. i think oh god <laughs> you know i there is a risk that this will impact um and i i'm on holidays in as of monday next week which is sensational so this will be the first time i've had leave in three years but you know significantly in the last 18 months which has been really full on with fires and then covid so yeah um, lots of organizations talk about the necessity for self-care um but it's really really difficult to look after yourself and to take time for yourself when your whole community is um, at risk and suffering and going through a hard time and that's what i'm seeing starting to impact on people um, who have up until now been people that I would describe as incredibly resilient. What an inspiring woman. Oh my gosh. The things that, um, that Sandy was able to do during the fires to look after the community here. They're so lucky to have her. Um, that's been the most fabulous morning for me. I'm really hoping that we can um, uh, do some more work here in this beautiful little community. I'll be 80% of people feel a bit euphoric um, immediately after an emergency. Uh, they can then feel kind of depressed as they're trying to rebuild their houses and get their lives back together. But over time, um, two, three years, uh, things can go back to kind of what we call a new normal. Um, but there are cases where you have uh, with support workers, so people in my role, for instance, and Sandy's role, where you can have that delayed reaction. So you're a bit euphoric, um, and then it kind of evens out as you're supporting other people, and then you can feel really hammered. Um, when you feel your community safe, you can start to get quite down. Um, and that's, I'm so glad to hear that she's gonna have a holiday. That's such great news. <laughs> Total number of calls that uh, we have made is 146,407 calls. There have been 455 staff and volunteers who have been involved and we have a visual rep representation here. One of these lovely faces is yours. <laughs> you can choose which colour you like to be. Hi, this is Carol calling from Red Cross. Can you please put me through to room 610? Yes, thank you. That's good to hear. Now, this is your wellbeing call. How have has quarantine been for you? Look, you've done everything right. Seriously, you've done everything right to get through this as best possible because quarantine is challenging. Um, you know, the only people who think it's easy are people that haven't done it. Hello, Mark. Mark, it's John from Australian Red Cross. Now, did you uh, did you receive one of the Red Cross hotel entry packs when you moved in? A little red and white booklet. No balconies or no fresh air. There's a window. Do you get a, much of a view out of your window? Or and you, it, what is it about day three for you today or day four? Oh, okay. Have you had a COVID test yet? and you don't have any pre-existing health conditions. The last few people I've spoken to actually live in Brisbane, so it's been a bit easier for them because they've had family that lives close by that can drop stuff off, but, but of course you're not in that situation. Your uh, family's a fair way from here. But, you know, as tough as it is, it seems to be working. It's keeping, uh, you know, keeping the, the COVID rates low in Australia. You'll think you'll make it through to the end, okay, to the 14 days, despite the, the fresh air issue, yeah. 
So about 18 months ago or more, yeah. I bet she's glad she didn't hop, hold, hold the wedding last year. <laughs> and so uncertain too, which doesn't help things, you know. One minute the borders are open, the next thing they're closed. So there's, the, the uncertainty has really got to a lot of people when they're trying to plan ahead. So, yeah. Oh, that's hard. That's hard. It's good. And, and how people look at it, how they approach it and their own attitude, that does make a difference to how well they get through it too. So it sounds like you two have done everything right. So full credit to both of you. Yeah. I'm actually off to the men's shed this morning um, to catch up again with Ray and I might just leave some of these lovely little cards, helpful notes from all around the world from people who've been through disasters and really helpful tips from them um, to aid recovery. So people are finding year two quite hard and quite tiring, uh, particularly for those people who kind of wish that they had made more progress um, in year one. And year one, of course, was so difficult because of COVID. Um, Ray, so tell me a bit about the men's shed and the idea of men's sheds. We meet every week and uh, more walks of life. Everyone's got a skill. We do things. We cut a lot of kindling and bag it and sell it through the craft, carry on craft shop. Yeah, yeah, okay. We donate a lot of money to the hospital, fire brigade. I think we donated $13,000 last year. It's just got such a lovely atmosphere. People are um, chatting away and helping each other with different projects mm. and coming and going. Yeah. I've never been into a men's shed before, so it was a bit of an honour. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the most amazing place. It's performed a fabulous role um, during bushfire recovery. Um, I've come down and run uh, supporting the supporters um, event down here, which was very well received. Oh, look, there's some furniture making taking place right now. So how's that? A lot of people yeah. in the community have a lot of chairs that need repairing. Okay. <laughs> so as a mentioned activity, it's great. And I used to do a lot of restoration in the past. Well, we all need somewhere to sit, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's some more activity here. Hello. <laughs> so I'm Jessica and you are? Danny. Danny. Hey there, Danny. Just seeing you back to the bushfires. It's just amazing. This tree here. Came pretty close, didn't it? Came close. Yeah, it, and actually, it actually lived at this. This has been replaced since. It has to, yeah. yeah. That. That's so, amazing. This structure here was damaged by it yeah. yeah oh and you know it's so so fantastic the sheds are okay because um i imagine there's quite a bit of um restoration work after the fires and stuff and yeah. nice for people to catch up yeah it was so a bit of reorganizing and thinking about the future Um, I'm Courtney, um, I'm the pillowcase coordinator for Queensland, um, as well as a presenter. Um, and today we're just packing some uh, pillowcase resources and so forth for our session at the uh, Brownies next week. So what is Pillowcase Project? It is a, a disaster resilience education program um, for grade uh, sort of three to fours, that ages eight to ten group. Um, and we get wonderful volunteers like Denise to, uh, to go into schools and do hour long sessions um, um, so that children are not only given the tools to, to prepare for an emergency but also given sort of the empowerment to go out and, and take the message into the community um, so which is, which is what we kind of focus on is for them to share with you know their household and their loved ones and their own connections so. We're here to talk to you guys today about being prepared, creating your own emergency kit. So what we've mentioned here, we've mentioned a few natural disasters, so flood and cyclone. So why then do you think it's so important to prepare for emergencies? Who haven't we heard from? Yes. Just in case they happen. Just in case they happen. Perfectly said. So as I said, Emergencies can sneak up on us. Um, so if we have a plan in place, 
we practice it and we prepare for it. It's also going to help to keep us calm. When we're calm, we make better decisions. And when we make better decisions, we can keep ourselves safe. Can anyone tell me what the difference between a need and a want might be? Need is it's essential, you can't not have it. Yep. Want, you, you want it, so you don't need it. Yes, yes. It's very hard to explain it. Um, yeah. 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 No! no. 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 <laughs> so we've got water, yep. change of clothes, yep. food, first aid, medicine, mm -hmm. and sunscreen. Yep. And we took out a blanket and toilet. Toiletries? Toiletries. Yes, yep, yep. Have a think about what you're going to put in your pillowcase. That if you had to leave home, what would keep you safe and what would keep you comfortable? The circle on the pillowcase has a few points. So, um, things that you can put in your pillowcase. But we also want you guys to think of things that make you happy. So, you can also draw those on the pillowcase as well. Whoa. So, I packed a sleeping bag. Yeah. My bunny which i can't sleep without it yeah my favorite blankie my ipad my toothbrush my my toothpaste yeah. and my ipad and my teddy and a medical i'm gonna put in food water a change of clothes yeah maybe toilet shoes yeah so you can brush your teeth yeah, yeah. and my special teddy that i will never sleep without why do you think it's important to prepare for an emergency so you know what's going on and you can, you know what you're doing. Yes, yes. I'm going to put my favourite thing and everything that's included, such as the clothes, the toiletries, lots of books. Tons lots of books. books. Do you like reading? Yes. Yeah. And so can you tell me about what your favourite thing is, what your special thing is? My special thing is a toy called Lula. Yeah. She was my third toy I ever got. Oh, wonderful. Thank you once again for having us and thank you for becoming a part of the Pillowcase program. Mm -hmm. Lovely to see oh, you. Oh, yes, there you go. <laughs> Super. <laughs> I've got a, uh, a selection of poems here that I've written in the last 15 months since the bushfires happened. Um, and they, the first one actually uh, began at 3.30am on New Year's morning in yeah. 2019. It was pretty scary, mm. I can tell you. I'd woken to a morning choked with acrid smoke, visibility less than 100 metres, a calamity bespoke. The signs had been apparent from my haven on the hill, where I'd watched a landscape festering from an obvious man-made ill. The place hadn't been cleared for 20 years nearly. New Year's Eve entertaining my guests, I made a suggestion, read the dance, which is part of our local culture here. Although I knew there was a chance that those plans may need sudden amendment as a pall of smoke appeared over the crest of my mountain opposite. Right across here. It was as if I had been speared. We witnessed its rapid transition fanned by an easterly curse, an orange coloured horizon. The conditions developed far worse as I feared for my friends in the township, for the folkies at Nariel Camp, my present companions anxious it's months since this place has been damp. So that was uh, that was definitely a real treat to hear those poems. Sorry, um, just then was telling me about how he put on a concert for about 120 locals in January. Got some local performers to play, did some poetry reading. Um, towards the end of the night, people were up dancing. Despite being clearly impacted by the bushfires, um, he was able to work with locals to, to get something happening and it's a, it's a great heartening um, story to hear, um, a wonderful story of recovery in this community.